Good day, folks. Um, welcome to this lecture entitled Normalizing Income. Um, this may be a little harder for those of you that are accountants that are very rules-based because this is becoming the, this is the art that we're getting into financial statement analysis. Uh, the first step is uh, really taking a look at earnings quality. And generally, we're looking for, for the purpose of the firm, as you recall, is long-term sustainability. And to do that, there has to be a relationship between net income and cash flow. So the question becomes, are the operating earnings backed by cash flow? Or are the accounting earnings more of an accounting result, the way something is handled? When we look at that, earnings can be more easily manipulated than cash flow. An, accept, an effective way to examine earning quality uh, is to really look at the pattern between operating income and operating cash flows. Uh, sometimes when we're looking at income, uh, to compare things period to period, we need to make adjustments to be able to conduct a financial statement of analysis. You've already uh, begun to do that and have found some things that um, may be different, maybe one-time items, or we may need to um, clean up a little bit, if you will. Um, and if we identify those items, we say, well, how can we decide what they're going to be in the future? How are they going to impact us in the future? Then you sort of need to normalize or adjust historical events to reflect just that. That leads us to the use of non-GAAP information, and this is information disclosed by companies um, that is not in accordance with GAAP. Now, there has to be a disclosure of this concept, but if we go back, GAAP is useful to get all this stuff out. Uh, as you've looked in a 10K investor presentation, there's a lot of material. When we look at GAAP, it's all in. It follows a set of consistent rules, whether the company likes it or not. In a non-GAAP situation, the company explains special items as, well, they're really not part of our base business. These are one-time things that when you're looking at us, you really shouldn't look at this as part of the run rate or the continuation of the business. So they attempt to normalize income and see what the base income, show us the base income. That's what we want to do too, is try to understand the base business. But I think we need to make the decisions. Can we use the information provided by the firms? And the answer is yes, but we have to evaluate it and say yes, because we need to use both. Okay, now where we are going is we are, when you're analyzing financial statements, remember you're doing it for a purpose. Okay, to either make a loan, uh, issue debt, an equity perspective, or internal capital allocation. Um, so when we look at it from a valuation perspective, it's based on income and or cash flow. Most of the time it's cash flow. Uh, for an investor, you're better to use GAAP because it's going to always generally produce a lower valuation. Uh, a company and investment broker, investment banker on the other hand, are going to try to get a use more non-GAAP because it generally will produce a higher valuation. So when we get into valuation, we're going to see this plus this pull and push that goes on. Um, there's those are the good points of normalizing earnings. Uh, downside when you start to look at it, it sets aside items that are generally the result of poor management decisions in the past. And their estimates used in valuation. And the last thing, it's not GAAP. Let's take a look at a company, come with companies so that you can get a sense of what's disclosed. And most, most of the disclosure uh, from between GAAP and non-GAAP is in, again, the 10K investor presentations. Here we look at uh, Steel Dynamics, and this is a schedule right out of their 10K, uh, or yeah, this is uh, or invest investor presentation. And what they do is show by year, here's the consolidated operating income, and they said, here's the things we've had. Now, we've already identified these, okay? Uh, so what we see is an adjusted operating income. Then, if we look down here, they're doing a adjusted EBITDA, 
And that starts with income before taxes and gives us additional disclosure on depreciation amortization that we may not always see. And then what they do is they're taking out unrealized hedge, hedging gains and losses, inventory valuation, equity-based compensation, and adjustment just asset impairment charges, which some of it which is up here. And they come up with an adjusted earnings before income taxes and depreciation. So this is what steel disclosure is uh, doing. We'll see in a second how do you apply that, but let's keep looking at some of the disclosure. Here is a Kraft Heinz, um, and they start out with net income. Here's the full year right here. And they go back and they add things, they disclose additional things and add things back and lo and behold, don't you come out that you go from a $10 million, $292 billion loss to a $7 billion profit, which still not good compared to the prior year, about a 10% decline. However, they give us all these big items here. And it's for us to make, uh, make sense of it. They also disclose earnings, EBITDA, by market segment so we can see what they've done there. They in turn uh, provide all of the detail exactly what it is. So if you were looking at Kraft Heinz, you could then read all of these and make a decision what to include. And I think a lot of this I, I probably would. And they summarize it a little better here um, when they try to take our fully diluted earnings per share for the two years and they redo them. So you can see that the Impairment losses were $11.34 a share, 03. Um, so then in prior year, you can actually see there was a downward adjustment for the revaluation of the tax reserve. So really they're even on a per share basis. But remember, there could be buybacks, which reduces the number of shares outstanding. Um, so that's Kraft Heinz, and that's how they portray it. If you notice, it's a lot more disclosure than Steel Dynamics, but when you look at Steel Dynamics, the stuff is relatively small. Now, this is Constellation Brands, and they do it a little bit differently, but the same thing, they're doing it by quarter of the full year. They start at reported operating income, okay, and then they come up with comparable. So saying we're gonna compare all the years, you can use these quarterly numbers and these year numbers as opposed to the numbers that are up here. So they walk through what uh, and tell you what they are, and then we have to make a decision as to are we going to normalize them when we do our work. So for analytical and forecasting purposes, we often normalize earnings. And we do that by adjusting key lines of the income statement to help develop a base to forecast growth. Let's take a look first with uh, Steel Dynamics, and then we're going to take a little look at a video on GAAP versus non-GAAP. The first thing I want to take a look at is earnings quality. And what I did is I created this little schedule that shows net income, uh, cash flow from operations. And as we can see from this, that there's an excess of cash flow over or under uh, net income. So what we've seen is over a five year period, cash flow from operations has generally exceeded the net income. So we have a much better confidence that these numbers are, are solid. So that if we're gonna to start to do some forecasting, uh, we can really use some of this as baseline information. So that's the first thing we do. Second thing is I'm gonna normalize income. So what I did is I started with my regular income statement here. I'm just gonna focus on 2018. Uh, so this is what I brought over. And then there are certain things that I wanted to normalize. The first thing is I had not broken out depreciation. So I wanna break that out. I wanted to eliminate the asset impairment charge. Um, inventory, um, non-cash inventory charges, an outage, non-cash purchase. And then, since I'm going to be comparatively speaking on this comparing things, instead of using the various tax rates, I'm going to use 30%. And that's an assumption 
I mean. Um, we could just go, and that's an assumption. So we're coming down to income tax, and I uh, use 30% because I want to have a consistent uh, view, and I don't necessarily want to deal with all these variations in the tax. So I'm using what I think the effective tax rate will be going forward so that in the forecast and the valuation, uh, there'll be some level of consistency. So what I did is I started with total sales from above and I made the adjustment. So I reduced sell, selling general administrative uh, to break out depreciation because I want to see that separately. Um, I eliminate the asset impairment charges and I came up with a pre-tax income and I use the same tax rate so I now have a normalized income that I will use going forward. I also took the information uh, to come up with an adjusted EBITDA and I came up um, with a number based on a series of assumptions that I made uh, because we're going to use some of this going forward. Um, and I got that from the schedule. So what I've done is I've essentially taken that and what you want to do is once you do it, uh, take a look at the PowerPoint presentation that is the culmination of Steel Dynamics to see how this fits. So at this point, let's go watch this brief video on... Welcome to the Finance Storyteller series. In this video, I'm going to discuss GAAP versus non-GAAP metrics which is the hottest topic in financial reporting. It affects the very core of a company. What is the reality of its financial performance? GAAP versus non-GAAP discussions impact investors, analysts, financial journalists, company leadership, employees, the audit committee and external auditors. A lot is at stake here. Here's an overview of how this video is built up, so you can make your choice of watching it all the way through from beginning to end or jumping straight to the part that is of particular interest to you. First section, what does GAAP mean and what is non-GAAP? Basically, why should I care? Second section, what are common non-GAAP metrics? What does it look like? Third section, why are there concerns about non-GAAP reporting? Fourth section, which guidance have regulators issued to improve transparency? GAAP means generally accepted accounting principles. More specifically, US GAAP, the accounting standards used in the US, or IFRS, the international financial reporting standards used in 126 other countries across the world. Using GAAP provides uniformity in how companies report their financial performance. Having accounting standards like US GAAP and IFRS enables you to compare the performance of companies within and across economic sectors, so the standards are necessarily generic in nature. GAAP numbers should be neutral, comparable and verifiable and provide information that markets can trust. Non-GAAP metrics are alternative definitions of in most cases profitability that are supposed to enrich the financial information that investors receive about the company's performance. In other words, free of charge additional information to provide insights into the company. That sounds like ordering steak at a restaurant like you always do and getting a free side order of vegetables with it. Many companies will include a footnote that states that non-GAAP metrics are useful to investors in their assessment of our operating performance and the valuation of our company. While the steak and vegetables analogy sounds good, a better comparison would be to use the classical optical illusion of the old woman and the young woman. What do you see? A young woman? An old woman or can you see both? The young woman is on the left and her gaze seems to be away from us, facing towards the top left. The old woman is in the center with her gaze facing downward and to the left. If that is too hard to see, try the duck and the rabbit. Is this a drawing of a duck with its beak on the left or a drawing of a rabbit with its mouth on the right and its ears on the left? Having a company present you with both gap and non-gap information is very similar to being asked to spot both perspectives in these drawings. It takes a bit of practice and some people are better at it than others. How does one spot a non-GAAP metric? Well, the words adjusted and excluding often give it away. Adjusted gross profit, adjusted EBITDA, 
adjusted net earnings, adjusted earnings per share, operating profit excluding special items, net income excluding non-recurring items, and on and on and on. By the way, some companies don't call non-GAAP information non-GAAP, but speak of core profitability, normalized profitability, underlying profitability, or pro forma measures. Here's an example of a company that provides a list of non-operational items that it excludes to get adjusted EBITDA and adjusted EPS, Verizon Communications. Its profitability according to GAAP was unusually low in 2012 and 2014 and unusually high in 2013 and 2015, mostly due to unusual charges or credits in an operating expense line called severance, pension and benefit. It was a very significant charge or extra cost in the range of 6 to 7 billion dollars in 2012 and 2014 and a very significant credit or negative cost in 2013 and 2015. If I want to do a long term trend analysis as an investor it is useful to have the company provide me with these numbers to normalize the trend and exclude the noise. Verizon is a very profitable company, both under GAAP and non-GAAP metrics, and adjustments from GAAP to non-GAAP can go either way. Results can become higher or lower when unusual items are excluded. Here's a second example, pharmaceutical company Valiant. In their overview of non-GAAP adjustments, to get from the GAAP net income at the top to the non-GAAP net income at the bottom, Valiant has a long list of up to 15 items and every year the non-GAAP results are higher than the GAAP results. In 2015 the company had a GAAP loss of 292 million but an adjusted non-GAAP profit of 2.8 billion after stripping out amortization of intangible assets, acquisition costs and other expenses. On a revenue of 10.4 billion that means the GAAP net profit margin of minus 3% has turned into a non-GAAP profit margin of plus 27%. Quite a difference. So why should anyone worry about the prol proliferation of non-GAAP measures? There are four main reasons for that. First of all, non-GAAP financial measures are not audited. The leadership of companies could be tempted to behave in a more opportunistic way in classifying results and defining metrics of success. Second, more and more companies are using non-GAAP financial measures, which defeats the purpose of the word general in the term generally accepted accounting principles. The Wall Street Journal recently reported that only 6% of companies in the S&P 500 index reported 2015 financials using solely GAAP measures. According to research firm Audit Analytics, this fig figure was 25% in 2006. Third, Analysts and the media have given non-GAAP metrics more prominence. Fourth, and perhaps most concerning, non-GAAP results are of very often better than those reported under GAAP, and the spread between them has been growing. SMP published a study of FTSE 100 companies showing that around 80% of the companies reporting an adjusted operating profit that was higher than the unadjusted operating profit. So the big question is, how do we avoid non-GAAP measures be becoming earnings before bad stuff? Fortunately, this issue is in the spotlight with regulatory agencies and accounting standards boards, all the way up to the chairman. They have made some very clear statements about the concerns. Securities and Exchange Commission Chairman Mary Jo White has said, non-GAAP information is meant to supplement the GAAP information, but not supplant it. And, in too many cases, the non-GAAP information has become the key message to investors. Hans Hogervorst, chairman of the International Accounting Standards Board in charge of IFRS said, non-GAAP measures represent the selective presentation of an entity's financial performance. Often that selection is not free from bias. And we have found quite a few examples of financial reporting where the IFRS numbers are overshadowed by non-GAAP measures. In some cases, it's really difficult to find an income line. Not only have representatives of regulatory agencies and accounting standards boards, boards voiced their concerns, they are taking active steps to reverse the trend of non-GAAP prominence. 
Let's remember the overarching principle of financial reporting. Financial statements should be fair and accurate representations of the company's financial position, result of operations and cash flows. For both gap and non-gap information, another key principle is that information cannot be misleading. The active steps that are being taken can be at the individual company level, with the SEC sending more comment letters to companies questioning their use of non-GAAP metrics. On the aggregate level, the SEC has issued formal guidance on this topic. Here are some striking examples of that guidance. A non-GAAP measure that is adjusted only for non-recurring charges, when there were non-recurring gains that occurred during the same period, could violate Rule 100B of Regulation G. When a registrant presents a non-GAAP measure, it must present the most directly comparable GAAP measure with equal or greater prominence. In this element of the guidance, the SEC really spells it out. Do not present a non-GAAP measure using a style of presentation, such as bold or larger font, that emphasizes the non-GAAP measure over the comparable GAAP measure. Do not place a non-GAAP measure before the most directly comparable GAAP measure. Do not include only a non-GAAP measure in an earnings release headline. Explain what is the purpose of the non-GAAP measure and why management believes investors would find the non-GAAP measure useful. Improvement is underway. Among the S&P 500 companies reporting results in the start of July 2016, 81% have given prominence to GAAP figures, an increase from the 52% that did so when reporting first quarter results according to an audit analytics anal analysis conducted for Wall Street Journal. I hope this was helpful. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to the Finance Storyteller YouTube channel.